God's children, we're good on sound, I'm waiting, okay. God's children are now uh, starting to talk about the Passover in the spring feast season or holy days or the days of unleavened bread. A little bit of chatter, typical, good to keep our focus. They'll no doubt be inspiring and able to recharge our spiritual batteries. Uh, We are full swing planning for as soon as we get back from our trip in Texas because they fall a little bit earlier this year on the the Gregorian calendar. They don't fall any earlier than God's calendar, but they do on this calendar that this nation and we are part of uses. But we're preparing for that, looking forward to it. Uh, The night to be observed we plan to have here uh, the Passover service as well, which also will be webcasted for those of you uh, that uh, would like to do that. I'm working on messages, preparing, uh, trying not to let the distractions of this world remove my focus. Yesterday morning, I was sitting in uh, one of the chairs, and I thought, well, I'll go left on my iPhone and see what the latest news was. And I watched something from one of the major news networks for about three minutes, and the rest of the day was depressed. So I said, I'm going to stop doing that, because there was just a lot of unique information in it. And it just wasn't where I wanted to go. God's holy days and festivals are a time not only to recharge our spiritual batteries, but also our physical health. Also our physical health. What I mean by that is evaluating whether we should you and I keep burning the candle at both ends trying to do more. Has anyone noticed in life it just keeps getting busier and busier? We've got someone here with us that's retired now, and I don't want to ask them yet if they're just as busy as they were before, but I would say they probably will be because every person I've ever met says when they're retired, it just means rather than being tired, they're retired. They're tired all over again. They just have plenty of things to do. And there's always going to be more to do in this life. It gets busier, more hectic every day, and it's then multiplied, as I spoke last week, in times of trial and difficulties. One person conveyed to me last week, they said, my one day seemed like a month. I'm like, wow, you got a lot done, or it just drug on forever. Concern, even consternations, is natural to be expected. Yet, if you and I are not careful, it can consume and monopolize all our time and thoughts. And so, we always need to keep in mind and review some of the basic attitudes of Christianity, which we'll be talking about here in a minute. You know, over the years, and I'm just reflecting here a little bit, but over the years, I've attended and conducted numerous funerals. I recall a specific one. It was a graveside funeral in a very small cemetery. And reflecting as I looked out over the cemetery, Gail, you might remember standing on the edge. It was so steep that you could hardly stand up. Had to be very careful where you parked and walking. It was kind of treacherous. But as I sat there, I began to reflect upon my life And I notice maybe you have two weddings, funerals, bring people together that they would never be together otherwise, whether family, whether fellowships, previous fellowships, whatever. You see all kinds of people that would not darken the door of each other's homes or buildings. Afterwards, as the family hugged and talked, I walked carefully around the cemetery and began to look at the gravestones, some from the turn of the century. And some may have been earlier, but the dates were barely readable. I couldn't tell for sure. It struck me how many tears have been shed over that little parcel of land as I watched the family. How many lives are buried there and some perhaps forgotten and unknown to any now that are living. And the fact that their only hope is the resurrection. God has not forgotten them. 
He will not forget us. It's one of the very basics of life that we must hold on to. I remember in Guatemala one year, again, I'm sharing, just reflecting here as we get ready for what we're going to talk about, walking down a street that we did every day. And I noticed a man laying across the sidewalk, probably passed out uh, from intoxication. He had a bloody face from hitting his head on the sidewalk. He had wet himself sometime during the night. And people just would come up to him and walk around him or step over him. It was a sad sight. But it made me again reflect on the blessings, the life, the faith as we live it. For that could easily have been me or any of us if it were not for the grace of God. I was also able to look at some of the graves while there. It's one of my pastimes. I like to go to graveyards and look at the names of people and their lives. And if you go back enough years, sometimes a whole family where two, three, four, five children died under the age of two. And I looked at the number of graves and the normal goings-on in Central America. There's been so much bloodshed over the years in Guatemala and other Latin countries. I remember also then one year at the feast back in 2005, a very dear friend, we'll just call her Anne, succumbed to cancer shortly after the feast. And as we walked back and forth during the, fe the Feast of Tabernacles, I would go back in the hall and walk with her And she was in so much pain, and she had to keep moving to try to numb out the pain. So as I reflected on a lot of these things that I'm sharing with you, I thought, you know what? You and I need to talk for a bit and share some thoughts in regards to Matthew chapter 5. You can go put it in another room if you want and under a pillow. You can do that if you want. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, and I want to spend a little time today covering a section of Scripture that contains another of those very basic elements of faith and life. I've read through it again recently. It has a different meaning, even a greater meaning after what's happened in this nation in the last year, the trials and the difficulties that many are working through, perhaps you will find it as helpful as I have. The section I want to discuss is found in Matthew chapter 5, and this is the beginning of what many have called the Sermon on the Mount, because he was sort of up beginning the entrance of the side of a mountain. Um, there's different comments from commentaries about it, whether that actually was on a mountain. But Christ started out by teaching what are called the Beatitudes. There are eight of them, or nine of them, depending how you count, very basic attitudes that Jesus knew His disciples would need in order to live a Christian life. They're very basic. We are doing a series every Tuesday night called Bible Basics. And I don't even think everyone connected understands the vision of what I'm trying to do with that because of some of the comments. But as we get through, I think we'll understand that. It is the Bible basics that the Bible teaches, not what people think. And in the body of Christ, there's a whole bunch of opinions. That's okay, and it's not okay. And... I'll explain that as we go through. Matthew chapter 5, let's begin as we start reading this. We'll first read the first three verses. And seeing the crowd, the multitudes, Christ went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came to him. So he got settled and set up, so he was comfortable, and then they you know, came up, it says, to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them. Christ was the good master, the teacher. 
We are all his students, his disciples, as were they. And he opened his mouth, which is what the Word of God is, the Word that became flesh, that became Jesus Christ. This is the very living, breathing Word of God. Does it matter what your opinion is on all this stuff? Yes, it does. Well, this group teaches this, and this one teaches this, and we just accept all of it. We have to accept what God says. Well, how do you know what God says? Well, part of it is you read it and don't read into it. You prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. Not like so many, disprove what was proved and then hold fast to what I like, right? Human beings do that. So he begins in verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens or the kingdom of God. Let's stop for a minute because we, you and I need to understand there are several ways to understand these attitudes. Number one, they are a code of ethics and a standard of behavior for the disciples and all that would follow them in the faith. Now, there's several loaded questions or comments here. They are a code of ethics. You ever heard of situation ethics? I'll decide what the code of ethics is. No, God decides. Standards of behavior. Certain standards of behavior are not acceptable to God. Yesterday, and who knows when this will get censored. Yesterday, I went into a uh, 7-Eleven after getting gas, and there was stuff all over the place. You couldn't tell the bathroom which was male or female, to which the lady responded, it don't matter anymore. Pick. And I thought, what about my granddaughter? What about my wife? Okay? Okay. There are standards of behavior based on the Word of God that are pretty specific. And then the disciples and all who would follow these attitudes, meaning live them in the faith. Describe who's in the faith. Those that follow and obey God. The ecclesia, the church, the body. It isn't. Well, I'm of this faith, you're of that one. It doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters what God says we should be doing. So you can look at that way. You can also have they contrast the values of the kingdom, which is eternal, with the values of this world, which is, some forget, temporal. It's very temporary. As you get older, you realize it's temporary don't you? When you don't get up, I'm going to go out and run a mile today. No problem. Well, my wife still does, but she's slower than she used to be, I think, a little bit. Maybe not. She might argue with me. I know she says, oh, this is sore and that's sore. I ran too far the other day. So, But you begin to realize that there is an eternal kingdom and a temporary world. They also contrast a superficial faith that the Pharisees had, the religious leaders, with the real faith God requires of Christians. And let me ask you, have any of you asked this question in the last year? Where is my faith? What is it focused on? And will God take care of me? Okay. Simple things like food and toilet paper. Okay. We're used to on the Gulf Coast when we have hurricanes and storms, we lose electricity. I there's a movie coming out. I hope I don't get sued for this. It's coming out. It's called Land. It looks interesting. This lady just goes and lives in Alaska or northern Canada or somewhere and no car, no phone, no radio, no nothing and faces some challenges. What have we thought about when your refrigerator and freezer runs out of food? I can't plant a garden where I live to save my life. 
You know, when I grew up, we always had a big garden. I was back in Nebraska visiting recently. I went out and took my foot and kicked some of the soil over. It is just black as your hair. And just beautiful, right? Black. Dirt full of things that will grow. You know? Okay, I'm sorry. Black as this. That's better. (laughs) I said, (laughs) oh, man. That's how I get in trouble. I just tell you. Anyway, the dirt, the soil was rich, and I know it will grow. Down here, it's mostly sand, and I guess you can grow something, although I haven't been able to grow too many things. Have we thought about? God says He'll provide for us. He doesn't say a T-bone steak every night, right? You remember the children of Israel when they were for 40 years traveling? God said, I'll give you the perfect food, and you eat the right amount and collect the right amount before the Sabbath, you won't be hungry. What did they say? Yuck! Right? You know what manna means? You ever do this when you sit down to dinner and you ask your wife or husband, whoever cooks, what is this? Manna means, what is it? Right? But it was the perfect food. Were they satisfied with that? No, they wanted meat, so he let the whole... Covey of the biggest covey in the world probably they ever seen came into the camp and they were so hungry and so impatient rather than cook it they just started eating it raw. But they weren't happy. They said, "Oh, the leeks and the garlic, right? I got to have my water burger." You're going to hope that there's even a burger. And so. These also show how Old Testament expectations will be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. There's a lot of meat in here. So these, as we go through Matthew 5, these are not multiple choice type thing where, well, I like that verse, but that one not so much. It's a package to be taken as a whole. They describe in minute detail what you and I must be like as followers of Jesus Christ. First of all, and I used to teach this at a Bible college, blessed, or if you prefer the old King James, blessed. Blessed. Each of these basic attitudes starts with the word blessed in most translations. It comes from the Greek word makarios, which speaks of the individual having the highest joy, which is immune from the problems and the difficulties of life. All we need is a joy that is immune to what we face in life. It means to be supremely happy and spiritually prosperous. I was walking the other day and a a couple came by that had just been vaccinated. And they were just all giddy. We got vaccinated. You know, and I'm I'm like, said, stand back a little bit. They said, well, why? I said, they said, haven't you? I said, no. No. And they were like, oh, well, we're safe now. They were joyful. And God bless them if they're happy now instead of fearful, whatever it takes for them. But to be happy, William Barclay wrote the following in this commentary about Matthew 5. He said, the Beatitudes are not pious hopes of what shall be. They are not glowing but nebulous prophecies of some future bliss. They're congratulations on what is. The blessedness which belongs to the Christian is not a blessedness which is postponed to some future world of glory. And we need to be careful because, oh, I just, just got to make it to the kingdom. Well, what about now? Well, he said, sex, this life stinks. And, but the kingdom. Okay, we, I'm not making fun of the kingdom, but we have a quite a length for some of us to go until that, you know? And we need to have vision, but we also need to understand what God says about now. It's something into which a Christian will enter into which he has entered. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5 and let's begin in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It seems odd to say that supremely happy and spiritually prosperous are the poor in spirit. Poor 
Greek, P-T-O-C-H-O-S, patochos, means absolute abject poverty. This individual, if we read this, you and I have realized is utterly helpless and defenseless and has put his total and complete trust in God. Let me ask you a question. Have we done that? That we need to do our part? We need to prepare? Okay. We used to say growing up, always be prepared for a rainy day. You know, set some money aside in savings in case you are unemployed or underemployed, or whatever happens. But if we spend every moment consumed with preparing for physical things, you won't be poor in spirit. There's a balance. Isaiah 66, verse 2. Let's go back there a minute, please. Isaiah uh, 66 and verse 2. Interestingly enough, let's go back, let's begin in verse 1. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and this earth thing is my footstool. I just kick back and I put my foot on that, get my feet up, rest. And the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me, and where is the place of my rest? That's a pretty profound question to hold the sermon there by itself. Verse 2, for all those things has my hand made and all those things have been, says the Lord, but to this man will I look, to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembles at my word. Being poor in spirit does not mean you have nothing materially or that material wealth is a sin, like the monks who take on a vow of poverty somehow believing that poverty equals righteousness. Rather, this person has realized that physical things are not everything there is. They mean nothing in perspective because the relationship with God means everything. But why do we worry? We worry about stability financially. We worry about food. We worry about protecting what we have. We worry about our lives protecting our lives. We worry about fill in the blank. And I said we, you and I. Don't we? Am I the only one that's been concerned about what's going to happen to our economy, our life, our jobs, our food, everybody else not worried about it? You're more converted than I am. We become consumed with it. We go along, oh, we're not happy until this happens and that happens and that. And God says, that's not in Matthew chapter 5. Did he not understand what we go through? God has to bring you and me to a point. We are simply willing to be, listen to me please, to be where God places us and bear whatever he lays on us. And that, humanly, is not fun. Pride and vanity are finally gone. We can humbly serve God and are willing to be spent as He sees fit. At this point, hopefully, no one's turned me off, said, I don't want to listen to this anymore. I hope not. Are we willing to be where God places us? Or do we constantly manipulate, attempt, work, struggle to be somewhere we think we should be, and God says, I don't want you there. I want you here. And you say, but, 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 but God, and he says, you can ask, and I'll give you what you ask when it's good for you, but I want you here. We've all faced that. And we may be facing it now. Right? Whatever it is. Psalm 40, verse 17. Go there with me, please. Psalm 40, and verse 17. David writes a prayer. This is a prayer in time of trouble. Verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me and heard my cry. Do we wait patiently for God? 
Or do we say, God, give me patience and give it to me right now. Verse 17, I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me, you are my help and my deliverer, make no tarrying, oh my God. So is it wrong to remind him, uh, God, could you speed up this process a little bit? Right? Could you speed this up a little faster? The quiet assurance, blessed to the poor in spirit, of being poor, there's a surety here that brings peace of mind, a present benefit, a present blessedness. You won't fret and fuss and worry so much, which then affects your stomach, your intestines, your heart, your mind. Right? That's what it does with me. Matthew chapter 5, let's go back and let's begin in verse 4, or continue in verse 4, sorry. Verse 4, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Happy and spiritually prosperous is the one who mourns. The Greek word here is the strongest possible word you could imagine. And it means a sorrow that hurts the heart and brings unrestrained tears to the eyes. I once knew a man, he's deceased now, going through a lot of difficulty, terrible things. And I was talking with him and I said, do you ever cry? And he said, men don't cry. I said, I'm sorry. He said, that's being weak. Well, there's several aspects of blessed are those who mourn. There's personal mourning. Deaths and trials, difficulties bring us personally to realization of the futility of this life. You remember the Borg on Star Trek? Resistance is futile. Mourning personal things brings a profound emptiness which helps us discover things about God we never recognized before. Until you've lost someone dear to you to death, to where you begin to meditate and ponder and think about what's really important. Do you have any folks you would just like to say, reach your hand out and they come back to life and you can be with them again? And you'd say, oh, man, we'll see them again, but there's a lot of time physically in our minds from that time until then. I remember an animal, not a person. I remember an animal that growing up, I had this Springer Spaniel that somebody had, they sold them, but they gave me one. And I spent the money, it was like 100 bucks to get the tail cropped, so it'd be a short little tail, which is what they had. And that was the breed and beautiful dog. Love that dog. And somebody intoxicated drove up in the yard and ran them over. They were tethered to a tie out, tie out in the yard, and they just ran up in the yard and killed them. And when I went over and, and remember carrying that dog to bury it, and I saw the person later, and I said, you ran over my dog. And they said, yep. I was like, but I remember thinking, and it was a dog, but I was thinking, I love that dog. And you may say, you're crazy. Animals, you know, well, if you've ever had one you're attached to, you know what it's like, right? And so, or if you've had someone you love deeply. I've had to do this way too many times. You go into a hospital or in a home and there's somebody, final stages, you know, of death. And I remember one house, my wife and I stood at the door and I stopped and I looked back and I said, you know, this will be the last time I see this person. And they died shortly after that. And you began to think about that. And you discover things about God that maybe you haven't before. 2 Corinthians 11. Let's go over there, please. Look what Paul went through. Have you ever asked yourself, why did Paul have to go through this? Because to me, no doubt, these experiences deepened his faith and matured his ability to life and to teach Christianity. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 
verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? He says, I must be crazy to use human reasoning, but I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, he said, they think they've had challenges. Let me go through what I've done. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, he says, I can't even keep track of how many I've had. In prisons more frequent, and it wasn't to visit people. In deaths often. Of the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes, save one. Forty would kill you, generally. So right up to the very last second, they said, okay, stop before we kill them. Three times I was beaten with rods. Think of a club like a baseball bat. Once I was stoned. That's throwing rocks at someone or boulders. Three times I suffered shipwreck. How can he distinguish three times, one time, two times, 40 minus one? Is, was he just, do you remember the first time you got fired from a job where you were doing a good job? Do you remember the first time maybe someone left you, your children, your mate? Do you remember the first time you got pulled over for speeding when you weren't and you got a hefty ticket and they didn't want to hear it? You may think, no one ever gets a ticket for not speeding. Really? Maybe you got charged for an accident. I remember a man, a good friend of mine, pastor, rainy, foggy time up in Wisconsin, and several cars and a semi ran into all of them, and he ran into the back of the semi, and he got charged for the accident for all of it. He couldn't force the semi into all those other cars, but his insurance company got charged for the whole thing. Hurt his wife pretty bad and tore the van up. God protected them, but I was like, really? Can you imagine? You got charged for pushing a semi into 15 other cars or whatever it was. A night and a day I have been in the deep, open sea, and it wasn't in a life raft with some crackers and a Dr. Pepper. In journeys often, in perils of waters, perils of robbers, you only have to be robbed once. You only have to have it or have somebody come up to rob you once. I've faced that. It's not fun. That's the understatement of the day. To experience that, to know, oh. In perils of my own countrymen, Thankfully, we haven't had that yet in this nation. I'm a bit sarcastic. In perils by the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in the wilderness, in the sea, among false brethren. He mentions being in the sea and water a lot. You notice that? I love going to the beach. I know many of you do too, but I don't like being out in a little boat out way, way out there in the middle of nowhere with no way to move it and no food and no water and it gets dark at night knowing how deep it is and the weather, I don't like that. In weariness and painfulness, you're so tired you don't care whether you live or die. In watchings often without sleep, in hunger and thirst, no food and water available, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, inadequate clothing, and then he throws in, shows Paul, those things that are without that which come upon me daily, taking care of the churches. And I can tell you as one of God's servants, sometimes it becomes taxing because folks just don't like what you say or do no matter what you do. They're not happy. And they let you know that more so nowadays than used to be. Another form of mourning, mourning for the world. There's a desperate sorrow in the people around us that we should feel too. They're cut off from God and continuing to heap on themselves curse and the shattering of God's law. They're reaping that. Do we say, give it to them, man? Well, of course we don't to our family members, but the other ones, that's okay. No, it's not okay. Ezekiel chapter 9. Let's go back there. Ezekiel chapter 9. And verse 4. A 
Ezekiel chapter 9, verse 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, symbolic there, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst. And the others he said in mine hearing, Go after him through the city and smite. Let not your eyes spare, and neither have you pity. So he said, Do you just say, they deserve this government. I hope they rot. Are we so jaded, even by the violence and suffering, we don't feel another's pain any longer? Do we even go so far as to make comments or rejoice at the calamity of others? I go back many years, I remember what happened and took place in Iraq and in, in Afghanistan. I remember in Guatemala the mudslides that would come down and wipe out whole cities. The earthquakes they had in Pakistan. Now, I mentioned Hurricane Katrina or Wilma. Some have already forgotten about that. If you lived here and you suffered from it, you didn't. All you remember is Sally and Zeta. What about the others that some have never recovered from? Romans chapter 9. This is how Paul felt. I hear it. Romans chapter 9. In Romans chapter 9 and verse 1, this is how Paul felt. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. And what I want you to notice is the deception of the world and the ruined lives. How does that affect us? Romans chapter 9. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience bearing the witness in the Holy Spirit, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites to whom pertains the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises, whose are the fathers of whom are as concerning the flesh, Christ came, his over all, God blessed forever, amen. This is how Paul felt. Do we have compassion and caring? Because they're eternal values. Their Christian values. Happy or blessed is the one who is able to care so deeply for the sufferings and sorrow of others. His or her prayers are more fervent. The efforts to help are more intense. Their faith more mature. We must never lose the empathy for the others. And that includes those that may not keep the Sabbath, the holy days, and not eat pork. If we reach that point, shame on us. Well, they'll get their chance so they can just suffer right now. Have you thought about praying that folks would repent so Christ, what? So this nation wouldn't have to suffer? Or do you say, well, I don't have to because I obey God and the rest of them, oh well. Another aspect is mourning for our sins. This is perhaps the main focus of this basic attitude. It's only through recognizing the depth of our sins and thus our own unworthiness before God we can truly come to repentance. And this is something we achieve as God brings us to it by degrees through our life. Psalm 51, we know that. Let's go back to Psalm 51. Uh, very familiar. Hopefully you'll be reading this as we come up to the uh, Passover. Psalm 51, verse 2, Wash me thoroughly from my lawlessness and cleanse me from my sin. Not their sin, not their problems, but mine. And I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is flat out. Everybody can see it. It's ever before me. We can get so focused on other people's sins, 
we forget about ours. And many will say, well, I've repented of my sin. They need to repent of theirs. You haven't. You're not. (laughs) Blessed are those that mourn. You're deceiving yourself. Against you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. David understood his sins. And though he didn't constantly relive them or bring them up, he never completely forgot who he was and what he had done. And I dare say that some of us, all of us, think about, oh, I remember doing that. Thankfully, God forgives us, but we keep going back and remembering, oh, right? Maybe it's someone you hurt. If you're so jaded that you can say, I ain't going to forgive them until they repent, you're on dangerous ground. Going down to verse 14, this isn't feeling sorry for yourself. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, from God of my salvation. My tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness, not mine. O Lord, open you my lips, and your mouth shall show forth your praise. For you desire not sacrifice, else would I give it. You desire not a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. We can think because we do so much Bible study, so much prayer, so much drawing close to God that we're pretty good. Now, if I could just get my neighbor, my pastor, my mate my friend, this other fellowship, this other person. That's not what it's saying. We need to look at ourselves. A sincere mourning that leads to intense repentance. From there, we'll find a comfort and peace of mind that it can only come from God. I've met many people that do all of the physical attributes. They don't work on the Sabbath. They go to church. They go to a potluck. They smile. They shake hands, right? And they tithe, and they donate, and they smile at people and do all those things, and yet they're not happy. And you know that. We all go through that. It says, most blessed with supreme joy will be those that are able to mourn in a godly sense. And one of the biggest focuses is looking at ourselves in the mirror and saying, as we say in Spanish, ayúdame, help me. Let's go on to verse 5 of Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is another dichotomy in today's world because meek is not an honorable word. If I had a shirt that said, you know, blessed are the meek, or I want to be meek, not I want to be me, but I want to be meek, most would understand it to be descriptive of one who is spineless, subservient, weak, and ineffective. Numbers chapter 12, Numbers chapter 12, verse 3, Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3, it says, Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the face of the earth. So he was a meek individual, but he didn't fit the profile I just described, did he? What does meek really mean? The Greek word praotes, P-R-A-O-T-E-S, was a term that described desirable ethics in Greek culture. It preferred, it referred rather to a total control of self in the receipt of injury or insult. It was a word that described a medium between great anger and no anger. It was a word used for domesticated animals. 
So it described having every instinct, impulse, and passion under control. It described a level of humility that allows a man to recognize his own ignorance and seek to learn rather than brag about everything he knows and that he's done. Again, William Barclay wrote, Oh, the bliss of the man who is always angry at the right time and never angry at the wrong time, who has every instinct and impulse and passion under control because he himself is God-controlled, who has the humility to realize his own ignorance and his own weakness, for such a man is a king among men. Proverbs chapter 16. Let's go over there. Proverbs 16. Verse 32, Proverbs 16 and verse 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that rules his spirit than he that takes a city. That's true meekness. It's harder to hold on to than a city won in battle. It comes from God. It's part of what God has been trying to reach us through the struggles of recent years. Are we learning? Many great rulers and men have fallen or failed because they could not control their tempers and impulses or their anger. No person, and this is what we need to reflect on, can ever lead others until we have learned to master Ourself. The people of God, the church, the ecclesia, those that have been called, will need this more and more in the years to come. Because if you don't and aren't being where God wants you, you're going to get angry. We'll get angry, won't we? if it's not going the way we think it should. It says these people, the meek, will inherit the earth. So they are to become a kingdom of priests to serve their God and teach mankind the ways of God. Do you think those you serve are going to make you angry? No, they're all going to do everything the way you think they should. Right? Right? Hopefully you learn this in marriage after a while. We all learn it or go through it, right? Stop trying to micromanage each other, which is what most people do. We do that, don't we? We want them to live the way we think we should or they should. What about the way people live? This is something I've tried to grasp. It's an Israelitish thing, if you will. The, the United States people think everybody should live the way they do whatever nationality they are. That's why you have Chinatown in L.A. or used to, and in New York. You have the separations, the Jews, a lot of the Jews live here and the African-Americans here, and they break up because they don't like each other's music, their food, their lifestyles, their dress, their cars, their music. And I watch this at the bird bath. Certain birds don't like other birds for whatever reason. Maybe they splash too much water when they're bathing. Or maybe they caw too loud if they're a crow. You know? I don't know. They're just, there's all these variances, and it says the meek, one of the things you're going to have to put up with is when people say, they ain't going to do it. So how you, how's he like them apples? Right? That's what we've tried to do in the church over the years is just micromanage everybody to do what we say and everybody's, it's a false unity. People aren't allowed to think. Let's go on to verse 6, Matthew 5. Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is both a question and a challenge. It speaks to the intensity of our desire or lack thereof for the things of God. Few people really have an idea what it's like in this nation to be really hungry or thirsty. I've rubbed shoulders with some brethren who do, especially internationally. 
Not being able to go to Starbucks is not being hungry or thirsty. Not having three full stretch your belly out till you can hardly move meals a day is not going hunger and thirsty. You notice what we say? Man, I'm starving. No, you're maybe hungry, but you're not starving. Big difference. Right? You might say, I'm really hungry. You know? Tengo hambre. I have hunger. At the time of Christ, the average working man ate meat once a week. And it was never far from he was never far from real hunger or starvation. We don't think about that. We just think it was all great back then. In the semi arid conditions of Palestine, water was a valued commodity. You can read that through the scripture. It was often difficult to find. So the hunger and thirst Christ described, you couldn't just alleviate it by a mid-morning snack of some pretzels or almonds and a glass of ice water or a cup of joe. Right? I have fluctuation of needing food at various times. And so sometimes I'm like, I want something and dinner's a couple hours away, I'll eat a handful of almonds. It takes the desire to, or I can just sit down and oh, eat till I can't move and then I'm not hungry for dinner. That's not what it's talking about. How great is our desire for the things of God? Do we study God's Word or do we make excuses? I can't read, I can't see, I can't hear, but I can watch TV. Or I can go out and play sports or tennis or whatever I'm going to do or watch TV. All the things you can do which aren't wrong, I'll get, I'll get with you tomorrow, God. I'll get with you later today. And then what happens? The end of the day is done, and you're like, I'll catch you tomorrow. And then the morrows turn into weeks, and the weeks turn into months, and then all of a sudden, uh-oh, right? We can measure it by the amount of effort we put in to attain them. How much of our daily lives are consumed with thoughts and actions of the things of God? I would not be disappointed on occasion when I log into Facebook if I saw more people posting things about how to live this way of life than watch the bear ride a bicycle with a banana on his head or whatever. Okay, what about the things of God? Matthew 6, 33, you know what that scripture says? We're, we're, let's just turn over a page, we're right here. Matthew 6, 33. Seek you first all the things that pertain to your physical well-being and happiness, and if you have time, His righteousness and everything will be added unto you. That's the revised slandered version. Seek them first. I have asked this question of myself and of many over the last year. When they talk about, oh, this guy's in his president, and this is going to happen to the economy, and I'm like, so... How's your Bible study? Are you studying? What have you been studying lately? Woo! You know, I, I'm almost afraid to ask that because I hear all kinds of, yeah, 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 but I, yeah, yeah, I do that, but then why are you consumed with all this? It says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added. To hunger and thirst, to hunger and thirst can only be satisfied by being filled with the Word of God and the Spirit of God. It has to be our priority. Psalm 119, 172. All His commandments are righteousness. This is where true righteousness comes from. We strive for all the commandments of God. Do you know what the second commandment is? Do you know what the first commandment is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. No, I don't have to love all my neighbors, just the ones I like. And I love God, He already knows that. I don't need to remind Him or tell Him or show Him. The commandments of God, the worshiping of God has been attacked through the centuries. There will reach a point in each of our lives that we will hold on to them for dear life if we still have them. How urgent are we 
for the things of God. Time is now to stop making excuses. Stop making excuses for why you don't spend time in the Word of God and all the other things we fill it with. We do. I do. You do. How great is our desire for the righteousness of God? Are we satisfied with Sabbath services once a week? A little prayer once in a while? Fasting only once a year because atonement says we have to. We crack a Bible periodically. Are we satisfied where we are spiritually? I think many are. I hope we can take on the challenge and the commitment from God and we'll continue to seek the face of God, the face of God. Spend more time with God. It will help us in the months to come. The future is still bright. It's getting there will take God living in us in a very deep and profound way. And these attitudes we're studying from Matthew 5 have to be part of our very character. Now, we've only gotten through about half of these, but I want to save the rest so you can go back today and go through and read these. Read these and how they apply to you, and I'll read them how they apply to me. In the near future, probably next week, we'll cover the other half. And then what we'll do is look at the opposite of these attitudes recorded later on in Matthew. That's the beauty of God's Word. He teaches us and then He goes back and reviews and says, okay, what did you learn and what do you still need to learn? Because there's still just a lot to learn. And I'm afraid some in the body of Christ have come to a point where we've been doing this for 40, 50, 60 years. We got it all down. We got the doctrine down. We understand it. We're living it. We're doing it as a person or a fellowship. And God says, really? Probably scratching his head. There's a reason we're called the children of God. Because we're children. Right? Some of us don't think we're children anymore. I hope we can go back and realize a return to where God wants us to be. And these are incredible. As Christ opened His mouth and began to go through these, we'll finish or go through more of them next time. Look at these from a very personal lens and perspective and ask God to live in you and to seek His will in our lives and to be satisfied and to be blessed and happy where He wants us to be. And stop chasing after wind, chasing what we think we want. You can tell God about it, talk to Him. Maybe He'll say, yeah, you can have that. Or maybe He'll say, no, that's not where I want you. And then accept that. So let's go ahead and close in prayer, if you would, with me. Our Father in heaven, we can call you Father, Abba, Daddy. That's not disrespectful. You've said that. We can, and we do. And we come before you, ask your blessing, your help, your encouragement. Father, help us to be blessed, to be happy, makarios, exuberant, that we have been called, our minds are open. We've got to live this. Don't let the cares of the world, the fear, that's not from you, the fear of the Lord, holy, reverent, respect, yes, but terror, trepidation, anxiety, those things are not from you. They're not the Spirit of God. Help us to understand that, to be bold as a lion. Proverbs 28 talks about that. To be happy, to be grateful, to focus on, accentuate the positive. Keep going as Paul did. And fathers say we are crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, we live, but it's you in us. So we just pray for you and Jesus Christ and your spirit to live in us and be with us as your children, your people, your body. 
We thank you, ask your dismissal, ask your blessing on the meal. Bless the fellowship of all those scattered. Thank you for all of those that have been communing with us today and worshiping you, God. All credit goes to you, and we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.